The sea covers two-thirds of our planet and has set man some of his greatest ever challenges. To explore it, conquer it, and survive its most deadly physical assault. Survivor dramatically reconstructs true stories of human endurance in some of the world's coldest seas and explores the science of their survival. Every year, on average, 140,000 people drown worldwide. Most die within a few panic-stricken minutes. Death by immersion in ice-cold water can take much longer. A slow, terrifying way to die. In September 1988, the Cougar a small fishing boat from Depot Bay in Oregon was on a private charter off the northwest coast of the United States. On board was a party of fishermen who'd paid $150 each for a day's trip to the rich deep sea tuna fishing grounds. Among the Cougar's sportsmen that day was Frosty Sloan, a supervisor in a sawmill and an avid fisherman. Pete Erickson, an iron worker from Illinois, regularly came to Oregon to fish. Callie Wynn, an experienced sailor with her own fishing boat, passed the time between catches photographing the dolphins. The fourth and final member of the party was Richard Boxwell, one of Frosty's workmates. Hey, buddy, how you feeling? Still feeding the fish? <laughs> Richard was a good sailor, but on this particular trip, he'd been seasick from the moment the boat set out. Frosty Sloan felt for his good friend, but this was Frosty's first deep sea fishing trip, and he was looking forward to doing battle with the fish. Whoa! I think I got me one. Woo-hoo-hoo! Woo! -hoo -hoo! Woo! Yeah! Come on, buddy, we're on! Come on, Frost, you can do it, buddy. Hang hey, on! Buddy. One heck of a fighter. That's a biggie. Come on. Oh, damn it. Oh, I lost too it. Too bad, too bad. Damn it. Next time. There's more out there. Oh. <laughs> Unknown to the passengers, the boat's bilge pump needed to expel water from the boat was faulty. The captain, Pat Watson, was aware of the problem, but told no one in the hope it would hold out. This was Watson's first deep sea trip. He usually ran fishing trips within five miles of the coast, but tuna live in deep water. The cougar was now almost 50 miles out to sea, carrying only limited safety gear and inshore radio required of boats operating much closer to land. Frosty noticed the captain's odd behavior but it didn't occur to him there could be anything seriously wrong with the boat. But something was seriously wrong. The bilge pump had finally broken down. Water was beginning to flood the engine compartment. If it got too high, the engine would cut out and not restart. To try and stop the flood, Watson began using a hand pump. In the cabin, the passengers were taking a break from fishing. Oh, sorry, guys. On deck, Watson was pumping hard, but making little headway. The cougar took on more water and settled lower in the sea. Oh, Rick, not again. Let's go take a look. 
Frosty was the first to realize the seriousness of the situation. What's going on? It's okay, guys. Look, there's nothing to worry about. She's just taking on a little walk. Look, uh, help me bail a while, huh? There's, a, there's another bucket down there. Right, uh, bail at the back. Okay. At first, I thought it was something a uh, little bailing could fix, and we'd be on our way. After all, Pat was the captain, and he said it was nothing. He didn't tell us the pump had bust. If he had, we'd have realized a lot quicker all the buckets west of Baltimore wouldn't have done any good. Why is she taking on so much? Kelly, being a boat owner, couldn't understand why we were shipping so much water. She asked Pat if the pump was okay. He said it was fine, just to keep on bailing. Watson continued to conceal their true plight from his passengers, but he was himself becoming increasingly desperate. Mayday, mayday, mayday! This is motor fishing vessel Cougar. I need assistance. Attention all stations. Mayday, mayday, mayday! We kept on bailing, but it just didn't seem to make much difference. Come on, Kelly, this is no time for happy snap. We gotta get a record of this. I guess we must have bailed for the better part of two hours, but I reckon we all knew, in our hearts, it was hopeless. We were fighting a losing battle on that deck. Kelly. That boat Kelly. was going down, and Just there was not us. a damn thing we could do to stop it. Richard's wife was a nurse. He remembered her saying, if you're ever in a sinking boat, put on all the clothes you can to keep yourself warm. So that's what we did. This is Cougar. Is anybody picking up my signal? Please, I'm taking on heavy water. Please come in any vessel in the area. Let's get back to the boat. By now, the passengers had lost all confidence in Watson. They weren't going to wait for his command to abandon the Cougar. We got to the point where there was nothing else we could do. We had to jump. The last to abandon ship was Pat Watson. As he left the wheelhouse, he grabbed some flares. Kelly. The current took Kelly some way off and she had to swim hard to get to us. I tried to pull her up on top of the float, but it wasn't strong enough to take her weight. We all just had to cling on to it as best we could. I kept thinking, we won't be here all that long. Pat must have contacted the Coast Guard. They'll be out looking for us already. Please, God, 
Keep us safe until they get here. The cold was so bad, it was like I was getting electric shocks. I tried bunching up, reduced my surface area, stopped myself losing heat, but it brought on the cramps. And the only way I could stop the pain was to straighten out. None of us did much talking. Words took up too much energy. Suddenly, Richard starts yelling. There's a ship. When Pat let off that flare, I just couldn't believe it. Here we were, floating in the middle of the pitch black ocean. Possible rescue passing us by, and all we had were these useless daylight smoke flares. Pat couldn't look any of us in the eye. Then he told us the radio was no better than a CB, that he hadn't gotten his mayday through to anybody. Now we knew. There was no one out looking for us. didn't understand what had taken control of Pat. But once he had drifted off, we knew. We knew we'd just seen a man die. Sometime later, middle of the night, I started talking to my wife in my head. Maybe aloud, I don't know. My darling Peach just told us it's five hours since we jumped. Seems more like five weeks. Callie died the same way Pat did. We tied her body to the float so at least her family might have her to bury. Several times I turned her over so she'd see the sky, but she keeps rolling back face down in the water. Rick's not too good, but he was weak from all his throwing up even before we jumped. Now he looks like he might be going crazy like the others. I'm trying to keep his head above the water, but he's so heavy my arms don't seem like they belong to me anymore. I shouted at Rick, talk to me. I just kept on yelling at him. I'm not going to let you die. I'm not going to let you do it. No, you give up on it. I'm not going to let you do it. No, you do it. Don't give up on me. <laughs> I 
I tied Rick's life jacket to the float. I didn't want him just drifting off alone, lost in the sea. He turned over as Kelly did. I tell you, darling, the ocean's so beautiful. All these tiny creatures glowing in the water like a million fireflies. You can see my feet. <laughs> I sure can't feel them, though. No. I guess it'll be my turn soon to go crazy, start rambling on like the others. Rick, uh, he sends his love. Callie, hey, you're going to like her, babe. <laughs> I'm not gonna go like them. Make it easy on myself. Just duck under, swallow the sea. I just couldn't do it. I thought of my wife and the kids. If there was the slightest chance of seeing this thing through, then damn it, I was gonna take it. When dawn broke, I was still alive. I can't tell you how good it was to feel the sun on my face. When the cougar did not return to Depot Bay, a US Coast Guard patrol was sent out to look for the vessel. By chance, the helicopter crew spotted the float and it was only then they realized the cougar had sunk. With only 10 minutes of fuel left, the rescuers started the difficult process of winching the two survivors to safety. Frosty Sloan and Pete Erickson were rescued after 18 hours in the freezing waters of the Pacific. Both of them were exhibiting the symptoms of extreme hypothermia. Frosty suffered severe muscle injury due to his continual shaking and shivering from the cold. The bodies of Callie Wynn and Richard Boxwell were recovered. Pat Watson's body was never found. There are a lot of studies and, and certainly a lot of circumstances where someone would say that once you give up um, on your own life and your own experience, that you're going to lose whatever that survival test is. You're going to flunk it, you're going to die, you're not going to make it. But I don't think that's the case at all. And I think Frosty is an excellent example of that because that's exactly what he did, is that he not only gave up on his own life, he gave up on everything and, and made peace with that. And then as a response to that, reached out to other people. And that's exactly what helped him survive. I think once Richard died, well, then it was really a real low point for me because he and I were the only, he was the only one on the boat that I knew. So that really left me alone and, and it, 
they, he was the third person to die that night, and so it, it just seemed like it was going to affect us one by, at a time. And I know how cold and miserable I was, and I think I just thought, well, you know, maybe my turn might be next, and I thought that was such a, a, a horrible way to go. There was no honor in it whatsoever. You know, if you want to die, it, it's just not the way I wanted to die, screaming at the top of my lungs and being totally uncontrollable in my body and then just die. And I just thought how much easier it'd be if I just swallow a couple of big gulps of water and just get it over with, but I just couldn't do that. I, I would think about my family, and I couldn't do it. It, uh, it was difficult, but um, you were still miserable, and, but it wouldn't go away, but you still couldn't uh, just do it. I guess maybe in my mind, I just, I couldn't feel like that was a way to desert them. In my mind, that's what I was gonna do. Callie Wynn's camera was recovered from her body. When the waterlogged film was processed, astonishingly, these images had survived. Pat Watson was found culpable, but the investigation otherwise came to no conclusion. The rules governing fishing charters were not changed, and boats still run trips out of Depot Bay, equipped with the same minimal rescue provision as the Cougar. Vessels there registered to carry fewer than six passengers still require no safety inspections whatsoever. The sinking of the Cougar was a small and tragic event in the long catalogue of marine disasters. Cold water can have a devastating and strange effect on the human body. If you follow your instincts in cold water, you're more likely to die. Most people are under the impression that if you're suddenly plunged into ice cold water, that you would die in under 10 minutes because of profound hypothermia. In fact, most people do die within 10 to 15 minutes, but it has absolutely nothing to do with hypothermia. People are dying because of cold shock within those first 15 minutes. Dr. Eric Weiss is one of the world's leading experts in the study of cold water immersion. Experiments recreate what happens when someone is suddenly subjected to the extremes of immersion in cold water. If someone unexpectedly plunges into icy cold water, they develop uncontrollable reflexes which make it very difficult to survive. The first thing that happens is they have an involuntary uncontrollable gasp. In fact, they feel like they're not getting enough air, but what they're doing is they're going <laughs> and they are breathing five to 10 times the normal rate. And if they happen to have their face near or under the surface of the water, there's a great potential that they will draw water into the lungs or into the back of the throat, which can produce spasms back there and produce profound panic and make it uh, very difficult for one to tread water or to keep their head on the surface of the water. And so these people eventually die of drowning, but the drowning is caused by the cold shock of the water. Cold water literally takes your breath away because of the way it can rapidly remove the body's heat. A thermal camera shows body temperature in terms of color. White is the warmest and black the coldest. Water has an enormous potential to conduct heat away from the body. It does that 25 times greater than air at the same temperature. You can never overcome that significant effect of the water. Therefore, you should always get as much of your body out of the water as possible.
After only 60 seconds in water at 15 degrees Celsius, the temperature of the North Atlantic in summer, the thermal camera reveals how dramatically this man's temperature has dropped. Even after he's left the water, his body warms up again, only slowly. When you plunge into cold water, you enter a survival obstacle race. The cold shock response is only the first of four hurdles you'll have to face. Any one of these hurdles can kill you. If you're still alive after five minutes in ice cold water, then you have survived the first stage of cold water shock. The next thing you have to deal with is outer body cooling and core hypothermia. Your body will begin to respond by uncontrollable shivering to try and generate heat to keep your body from cooling. Shivering is a response to cooling of the skin and really has nothing to do with core hypothermia. At the same time, the blood vessels on the surface of the skin will shrink down very, very tiny so that blood flow does not go to the surface but stays in the core. The downside to that is you get dramatic cooling of the skin, the nerves, and the muscles near the surface. And within 10 to 15 minutes, an individual finds it very difficult to coordinate their muscles. They're not hypothermic in their core, but their muscles and nerves are almost paralyzed because of the cold. For Frosty Sloan, being adrift in the Pacific for 18 hours was the equivalent of lifting heavy weights for the same duration, non-stop. You're shaking so hard that it's, it's just like a burn. You can't stop the muscles from shaking, and it's just like their muscles are burning. And it never went away. It just constantly was like that. And you just, at first, you have that on your mind all the time, but, because the cold is still always there, but you can never get rid of that shaking and that burning feeling. The next lethal hurdle in the cold water immersion obstacle race is hyperthermia, the cooling of the body's inner core. You become lethargic. The mind becomes confused, which can lead to irrational behavior and eventually death. Just when you think safety is at hand, the last and unexpected hurdle in the survival obstacle race looms. And to be a survivor, you must overcome it. Rescue can mean just the opposite for the unlucky few. One of the first people to study air-sea rescue techniques was Surgeon Rear Admiral Frank Golden of the Royal Navy. When I worked with air-sea rescue squadrons in the 1960s, I came across several examples of people who were alive before rescue, talking to other survivors in the water. And yet, when they got on board the helicopter, they were found to be dead. So they died very quickly, and that death was not, actually could not be due to cold. That's much more suggestive of a blood circulation problem, almost as if they had a heart attack during the rescue period. Frank Golden discovered that rescue can be life-threatening in a number of ways. At the point of rescue, two new challenges confront Frosty. First is that people, just on the point of being rescued, when the helicopter appears overhead, they suddenly seem to say, oh, thank God for that. And the adrenaline, which has helped to maintain their blood pressure and keep them alive throughout their survival ordeal, suddenly stops flowing. And at that stage, their blood pressure could fall and their heart could stop. The second danger is that if they have to make a physical effort to assist in their own rescue, then that will increase the workload of the heart at a time when this heart is beating very slowly. And again, that could be catastrophic and could stop his heart as well. The line between survival and death is a delicate one. Much depends on physical build. Well, surprisingly enough, it's not the lean, fit, young athlete who will survive.
for a long time in cold water. It's usually the fat, spherical, unfit individual. It really is a case of the survival of the fattest when it comes to immersion in cold water. And the reason for that is that the fat beneath the skin acts as an insulator. It's like a wetsuit that the person is wearing beneath his skin. So the thin, lean, weight-lifting, fit young man, he'll cool at a very quick rate in water, and the fat slob will be there several hours later. Because of their body shape, women generally have more fat than men, so they're more likely to survive. Yet, whatever your build, there are things you can do to give yourself a fighting chance of survival. In the cougar incident, those who put on extra clothes were very wise. That action alone probably helped save their life more than anything else. Regrettably, the captain who didn't, I'm afraid it was probably a major contributory cause to him not surviving. Both Pat Watson and Callie Wynn did what you think would save their lives, but was actually more likely to kill them. Swimming. In normal circumstances, exercise warms you up. But in water, when you exercise, you're moving your arms and your legs, well then you're in accelerating the rate of heat loss to the surrounding water. So in water, the best thing to do is to stay as still as you possibly can, keep your legs together, the arms by your side, and wait patiently for the rescuers to come to you rather than you trying to swim to save your own life because swimming will accelerate the heat loss and you will die more quickly. All the evidence about the dangers of swimming was, however, confounded by one astonishing story of endurance which took place off the coast of Iceland in 1988. The night of March the 11th was a cold one. The air temperature was minus two degrees Celsius. The Hellasy, a 74-foot trawler, was fishing for cod out of Vestmanaya, 80 miles southeast of Reykjavik. She carried a crew of five. Among the crew was a 22-year-old fisherman, Gudlauger Frithorsen. At 9.50 p.m., the trawler's net snagged on the seabed. She capsized and sank so quickly, the fishermen were unable to launch a life raft. Gudlauger could only watch as each of his friends surrendered to the freezing sea. Alone and three miles from land, Gudlauger started to swim to the shore. At first, he swam breaststroke, but he swallowed so much water, he had to turn on his back and kick with his legs. They became heavy, and his muscles began to seize up. When his head became cold from immersion, he had to return to breaststroke. The water was a potentially lethal five degrees Celsius. Gudlauger had no life jacket and was dressed in only a shirt and jeans. But he was a large man, weighing nearly 20 stone. Gudlauger swam for six hours against the currents.
With the coming of daylight, his body exhausted and his mind confused, he finally reached the shore. Being able to swim for six hours in that temperature is truly an extraordinary feat, probably explained by his enormous size, because large people cool slower than small people, and by the amount of fat and muscle that he has, which protected him from hypothermia because it acts as insulation. Gudlauger struggled ashore, cutting his bare feet on the sharp volcanic rocks. He walked for over a mile until he reached an isolated cottage where he collapsed from exhaustion and hypothermia. There are on record other stories of survival which seem not only as amazing as that of Gudlaugers, but utterly impossible. Every year, hundreds of people die by falling through thin ice in what appears to be on the surface an ideal winter playground. One winter day in 1984, four-year-old Jimmy Totlowitz was out sledging by Lake Michigan in North America with his father. They strayed onto an area of weak ice. Jimmy! It had started as a sled ride along the ice-coated rock on the shore of Lake Michigan at Wilson. A slip, and 35-year-old Terence Totlowitz and his four-year-old son James were suddenly in the near-freezing water. It took over a quarter of an hour to rescue Jimmy's father. That left a child somewhere in the murky, ice-clogged water. Time after time, the divers surfaced. Nothing, they shouted. But then the divers nodded. Success of a sort. A number of children have, despite being underwater for incredible amounts of time, much longer than anyone would ever predict possible, Despite the fact that when they're pulled out of the water, they have absolutely no signs of life, no heartbeat, no breathing, their pupils are fixed and unreactive. After prolonged periods of resuscitation, some of these people are brought back to life. It's like life after death, because they literally are dead and then they're resuscitated. It is absolutely remarkable and defies all predictions for outcome. Jimmy survived after being submerged for an astonishing 38 minutes. How is it some children like Jimmy can survive underwater for such extreme lengths of time? It is still a scientific mystery, but it may be related to the fact that as babies, we have an innate affinity for the womb-like environment of water. Babies have not lost the instincts that link humans with their more primitive evolutionary selves, when water was their natural environment. As we grow older, we don't use it, so we lose it. It could also be that babies retain something of the response that other mammals have in water. Some species of seal can survive for up to 40 minutes on one lung full of air by a process known as the diving response blood is directed away from the extremities to the organs that need oxygen most, such as the brain and the heart. 
Yet there is another theory as to why some children can survive prolonged periods of time underwater. When the body is very cold, its metabolism slows and the requirement for oxygen is reduced. If the brain can cool quickly enough before it's damaged by lack of oxygen, the chance of survival is increased. The body must very swiftly cool from the inside as well as the outside. And the only way for this to happen is by the rapid breathing of a lot of cold water into the lungs. Children have stronger hearts than adults do, and they can probably keep pumping blood around when oxygen levels fall, whereas in an adult, the heart would probably stop. And if you can keep this cooled blood going to the brain and to the other organs and cool those organs very quickly before the heart stops, then you can protect them from dying from lack of oxygen. And it's really quite a paradox, isn't it? Because the same reflexes and shock that leads to death in when someone has their head above the water probably saves their life when their head is below the surface of the water. And so, in the most extreme cases, when the human body is stretched to the limits of endurance, that relentless killer, cold water, can, ironically, become a lifesaver. And for the survivors, such experiences change them. It literally does scrub their life experiences totally clean, right down to the real basics. And even when you meet somebody 50 or 60 years after they've had that kind of an experience, it has changed them. I mean, and it stays with them. That, that sort of elemental quality stays with them forever. I came very close to losing everything in just a matter of a day, because I know I really appreciate my family a lot more and think about them a lot more than I did before I took them for granted, and now I don't, not for a minute. And I think it's, that's it, is to appreciate what you have, because you could lose it in a heartbeat. And I came really close in, uh, I don't want everyone to lose that again.